Hey, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Today we're going to cover something a little bit different. You saw a little hint there. Instead of covering one of the American great painters uh, from the mid to late 1800s, we're going to cover one of my all-time favorite painters and one of his great works, Claude Monet. This is a first for me on my channel here. As mentioned earlier, I typically uh, focus in on those uh, American painters uh, from the late 1800s and mostly uh, focus on tonalist style paintings. Obviously, Monet was known for his impressionist style painting. He clearly fit within that school of painting and that style of painting. And we're going to do our best to uh, recreate my own version of this wonderful painting called Hauling a Boat Ashore. And it was painted, at least it was believed to have been painted in 1864. I'm working my way through as I normally do, initially toning the canvas with almost pure yellow ochre and uh, quite a bit of linseed oil and started to lay in some of the major shadow patterns or shadow shapes within the painting uh, using a mixture of burnt umber and Payne's gray. At this point, you could see uh, most of the major structural elements within the painting, the shore, the beach, uh, the mid-ground uh, hills with some of the buildings and the lighthouse off in the distance along with the boat. and. A little hint of what the shapes which will ultimately comprise some men hauling the boat into shore uh, will look like. These are just basic notes for me that'll help me uh, you know kind of formulate the entire painting as we move forward. I did speed up this section of the painting uh, just to keep the total duration of the video you know to around an hour. I did lose a little bit of video, so you saw the film jump a little bit to the stage in the painting where I added a mixture of burnt umber along with a lavender color that I mixed up uh, using red and blue in some of the cloud structures that make up the sky. Oh, I'm getting there now. At this point, slowing down the painting to a real-time normal speed as a lot of the work that will be done will be a little bit more nuanced in particular as it relates to you know color mixing and brush strokes and just general thought process as we finish up this piece also at this point I'm thinking about you know next steps and you know what I'm concluding here as I take a step back and look at this so far and the progress that we've made is that I do need to build up uh, the cloud structures a little bit more and I'm going to use a slightly larger flat brush and going to dip into uh, the puddle of purple that I created and I'm going to continue to build up some of the major cloud formations particularly in what essentially is the foreground area of the sky where the cloud cover is a little bit closer uh, to the vantage point here. Just a little bit about uh, Monet and his biography. Um, it can't be stated or emphasized enough uh, the influence that Claude Monet had on the art world. Uh, Monet has been described as the driving force behind Impressionism. Crucial to the art of Impressionist painters was the understanding of the effects of light and local color of objects. And the effects of the juxtaposition of colors with each other. His free-flowing style and use of color has been described as almost ethereal and the epitome of Impressionist style. Impressionism, or Impression, Sunrise, is an example of the fundamental Impressionist principle of depicting only that which is purely visible. Monet was fascinated with the effects of light and the painting and painting on plein air. He believed that his only merit lies in having painted directly in front of nature, seeking to render my impression of the most fleeting effects. That was a quote of his. 
wanting to paint the air and often combine modern life subjects in outdoor light. So uh, many of his more famous paintings, um, water lilies, for example, and then some of the paintings that he did, uh, you know, throughout throughout Europe, including uh, the cliffs at Etrat and a uh, sailboat behind the needle at Etrat, and um, he did a series of uh, paintings. Uh, I think it was called Grain Stacks, Grain Stacks in the Light, uh, where he painted the same scene over and over again at different uh, times of day, uh, you know, capturing the different light effects and shadow effects and so on. Um, these are some of his more uh, famous paintings, uh, Morning at the Sin, um, the Seine uh, near Giverny, um, uh, the Rouen Cathedral, Morning Light, and that's another one of his subjects that he painted throughout the day. There's just so many of them uh, that have uh, that have influenced so many painters. Uh, there were two paintings, I believe, from uh, a series called The Houses of Parliament in London, and uh, that too uh, was a series that showed you know, the same scene painted at different times of day with different light effects. But this particular painting that I'm covering today uh, had a, a significant impact on me. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure where... I first saw this. It might, it might have been an image that I saw uh, maybe at a show at, um, um, you know, one of the museums in New York. I'm not sure when I was a child, and I just remember uh, marveling at the, you know, the effects that were created, the light effects that were created, with some simple, broad, thick brush strokes. And uh, it left enough an impression on me where, you know, it compelled me to want to learn how to do that. So uh, fast forward, you know, probably 40 years or so, and here I am trying to recreate the painting by doing a painting study of this great Monet painting. And at this point, I've gone through and uh, added quite a bit of color to the sky and I'm not really at this point paying much attention to the brush strokes. I'm using very thin paint. Um, the only kind of exception to that rule is uh, in areas where I'm trying to create the illusion of perspective, particularly in the sky and uh, the surface of the ocean as it gets closer to the horizon line. Uh, just taking some care to use much thinner, more horizontal strokes to create the illusion of perspective. As you can see right now, I'm using a cotton swab as well, just to create some varied strokes, ones that are, are blended in with the surrounding area uh, to help reinforce and bring additional um, you know, structure to uh, what, are, what is intended to be an illusion of uh, the banks uh, which which kind of flow into what looks to me like uh, a little bit of a seawall. And I'll also use the Q-tip as well to, uh, you know, shape uh, the beach off there in the distance in this little cove and uh, also create the illusion of some surf breaking on the shallows. Among other things, at their various points throughout the painting, I'll also, like I am now, use cotton swabs to, you know, scrub away some paint in areas where, um, you know, I want to ensure that we don't have paint mixing on the canvas and, and also in areas where uh, the tonal quality is much lighter than other parts of the painting. So a little bit more about Monet for those that aren't familiar. Um, you know, he was born on November 14th in 1840, and I believe he was born in Paris, uh, Paris, France. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think he may have spent much of his lifetime living in Normandy, uh, France. And, um, you know, there's just something about the painters from this time period, uh, mid-1800s through early 1900s. Uh, I've heard other modern day painters kind of reference this uh, as well. But, you know, what I observe is that they just knew something about, you know, um, 
depicting nature in its most divine forms and capturing beauty in a way that seems to have been forgotten. And we're seeing, thankfully, you know, more and more painters um, today kind of focus on capturing or at least chasing the same sort of effects. Uh, and I'm grateful for that. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm no fan of kind of the modern art movement that we saw kind of permeate in the mid 1900s through, um, you know, through the rest of the century. Um, and I'm just grateful anytime I have an opportunity to learn more about how to capture kind of these natural scenes in a way that at least does, you know, does the great work of mother nature, you know, some justice. And I think Monet definitely did that here. I'll likely fall short a little bit, but I'll do my best. And here, uh, much of the rest of the painting, I'll work my way through gradually uh, using thicker and thicker paint. And just like I do in all my paintings, I'll weave back and forth amongst the different elements within the painting from, you know, the men hauling the boat on shore to the boat, to the ocean, the foreground, midground, background sky, back and forth amongst all of those elements just shaping and reshaping them, reinforcing them, adjusting color, uh, breaking up the strokes, and all along the way, gradually building up thicker and thicker with the paint. Right now, at this point, uh, probably about, let's say, a third of the way through the painting, and I would say, on average, you know, the mixture or the ratio of linseed oil to pigment out of the tube, um, you know, it was probably somewhere around 50-50 to 70-30, you know, pigment to linseed oil. And uh, that, that'll that gradually shift to uh, at the very end where it'll be 100% pigment being put on the canvas, you know, building up the viscosity, the thickness of the paint as we move through. Now, I already have most of the major shadow patterns built in, but there will be times, like right now, where I'll have to reinforce them. I'm using almost pure Payne's Gray at this point to do so. And uh, occasionally I'll add some ivory black to that. Occasionally I'll add you know, a little red or a little uh, lavender or blue or what have you, you know, just to shift the, the, the tint of that particular gray you know, to meet the need. Of the painting. And when I look at this painting and think about, you know, what it is I want to accomplish, you know, one of the one of the things aside from accurately rendering, um, you know, the complete image is I'm hoping to accomplish the same effects that Monet was able to. Uh, accomplished in so many of his paintings, as mentioned earlier, putting colors side by side that uh, have an effect, a resonance with one another. And, you know, just a uh, case in point, you can see some of that formulating here uh, amidst and amongst the, the blues and the yellows. Um, you know, the cooler and warmer colors next to one another. You know, along with the uh, purples and the yellows and the reds, um, and the yellows and the browns as well. So, you know, those colors side by side, juxtaposed against one another, have some sort of resonance or they create some sort of vibration on the retina and within the brain of uh, many of the viewers. Uh, I know it has that effect on me that uh, makes the painting kind of come alive a little bit. So we're hoping to capture some of that. Uh, some of the things that will will be different um, the the actual uh, aspect ratio is a little different um, Monet's original painting had a little bit more width to it so he had more room uh, to arrange his painting in a way where uh, the boat would would actually lie a little bit further offshore and uh, the peninsula that the uh, that the lighthouse is on would extend a little bit further out as well. So I, I will, and I have already, but I'll, I'll, com I'll compress my image to fit within my 5 inch by 10 inch canvas here. And that'll be one of the, the big differences. If, if you look at 
uh, the original Monet painting and my recreation here side by side, you'll note that the boat is actually not directly beneath the lighthouse. It actually extends a little further out. And uh, I think it's going to work out anyway, uh, despite that difference. I think most of what I'm setting out to accomplish here will be able to get done just based upon what I'm seeing and how this painting's coming together so far. But only time will tell. I'll continue to kind of modulate back and forth um, between those those contrasting colors that I mentioned right now, obviously working through the the ocean and working back and forth between the blues and and the yellows. Trying to avoid creating mud whenever possible. You know, blue and yellow together kind of make green. We want to avoid having uh, almost like a pure green <laughs> on the water here. You know, a little bit of green's fine, but uh, at this time of day, uh, it's it's more accurate to actually, you know, have those sharp contrasts between the the sunsets or sunrises uh, reflection. In this case, I believe it's the sunset on the water, and then the you know the slight blue that would be reflected up off the water along with the darker shadows. So, as mentioned earlier, just going to continue to weave my way through from the beach to the ocean to the foreground to the midground to the sky. Yeah, right now scrubbing in. Uh, some of the blue that's left on my brush onto the beach there. I'm going to go ahead and wipe off my brush here and going to move into uh, some more pure blue uh, mixed with, I think it's a mixture of ultramarine blue mixed with uh, a little bit of titanium white now and you know, making sure that a little bit more of the purer blue gets mixed into the water here. And I'll work my way back and forth. You know, one of the um, you know the benefits of doing these studies I'm finding is when I do go out and paint in the field and try to you know capture a scene live on site in nature. You know I have the benefit of this experience where. Yeah, I've been able to work through capturing different effects that have been done by, you know, great master painters like Claude Monet or, you know, George Ines. And I can apply those lessons from, from that experience uh, to the effort to capture images on site. And I find it is influencing, you know, my confidence. It's influencing um, my adaptability and uh, not only that, you know, when it's not just about the application of paint and the brush strokes and the effects, it's also, uh, you know, having an influence on my ability to identify, you know, good composition. So, you know, am I, you know, where I hope to be someday with all the skills associated with those things? No, but uh, definitely improving more rapidly uh, than if I, I didn't take on this long term series that I'm calling Study of the Greats. It's definitely helping me. Uh, level up my painting skill skills in uh, in a number of ways and you know those are just a few of them that I mentioned earlier so working my way back through the painting uh, you know realizing that the ocean closer to the horizon line is just a, a little too dark so and, and a little too much of a solid shape so working my way through you know adding some varied strokes and I'll use that same paint and scrub in and brush in some of that same color into the sky, particularly amongst the cloud shapes that are closer uh, to the vantage point that you know this painting was created from. Naturally, we want some of that blue up in the sky um, because if it wasn't up in the sky, we wouldn't see it in the water. So um, we want to make sure we we make that adjustment to the painting here. The history behind Monet's ascent in the art world is, is interesting. And um, every time I read about him or look through, look through some art textbook, um, you know, I often find little nuggets of information that either I forgot or, or I never stumbled upon before. But um, 
Yeah, one of the lecks are uh, actually from Wikipedia uh, that addresses his time uh, living in between Paris and Algeria uh, from 1858 to 1860 or so. Monet studied art in Paris, where he enrolled in the Academy Suisse and met uh, uh, Camille Pizarro. Camille Pizarro. I know I'm butchering a lot of these names and a lot of these cities and towns. Forgive me, please. But he was called for military service and served under uh, the Chasseurs d'Afrique, or the African Hunters in Algeria, from 1861 to 18, 1862. His time, it was said, spent in Algeria had a powerful effect on Monet, who later said himself that the light and vivid colors of North Africa contain the germ of my future researches. He uh, had grown ill at one point and had to return home, where he bought out his remaining service and met with uh, Johann Barthold uh, Jeanquin, who, together with Bo- uh, Boudin, uh, <laughs> was an important mentor to Monet. And apparently uh, his relationship with his father uh, was a little strained. I think his father wanted him to go into the family business and didn't want him to pursue art. And there were probably other things, as there always are, you know, between parent and children, those parent-child relationships. And and he ended up um, buying out his own service contract I guess it was uh, at some point documented that his father could have bought it, bought out his son's exemption from conscription, but declined to do so after Monet uh, refused to give up painting. While in Algeria, Monet completed only a few sketches of Casbah scenes, a single landscape, and several portraits of officers, all of which have been lost apparently. Following his convalescence, his aunt intervened to remove him from the army if he agreed to complete a course at an art school. It is possible that Jean Quin, um, whom Monet knew, may have prompted his aunt on this matter. Upon his return to Paris, uh, with permission of his father, he divided his time between his childhood home and the countryside and enrolled in Charles Galliere's studio, where he met Pierre-Auguste uh, Renoir and uh, Frédéric Basile. Um, apparently, Basile eventually became his closest friend, and in search of motifs, they traveled to Hanfleur, uh, where Monet painted several studies of the harbor and the mouth of the Seine, or the Seine. <laughs> Monet often painted alongside Renoir and Alfred Sisley, both of whom shared his desire to articulate the new standards of beauty in conventional subjects and uh, you know, formed what I believe was uh, the beginning of the Impressionist movement. So hopefully you can forgive me for all the art history and the terrible pronunciation throughout. And uh, you just know that you know one of my objectives when it comes to you know, building these episodes for my channel is to uh, help educate both myself and any viewers, you know, about some of the more important historical aspects within, you know, the painting, various painting movements that I might cover uh, in these study the great episodes and um, also help those who you know, maybe are also interested in leveling up their painting skills to do so through, you know, the interconnectedness uh, between the history of art and the effort to actually build pieces um, in modern day. There's a, there's a lot to be learned, you know, through the experiences of these artists and, you know, the documentation around their process and their, their lives and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, for example, you know, there are a lot of folks who feel like they're hamstrung and they don't have the time or the support that they need in order to paint. Meanwhile, you read about, you know, folks like Monet, who definitely had some headwinds, um, you know, somewhat unsupportive family. Well, at least his father apparently wasn't very supportive. And, uh, you know, he very easily could have used that as an excuse not to paint. And, you know, the world, you know, would, would uh, definitely would have lost you know, quite an interesting figure and, you know, a lot of beautiful paintings and, 
you think about all the people who maybe were motivated to capture beauty through art um, as a result of the work that Monet did. There might have been folks who, uh, throughout the past few centuries, that you know, never had the opportunity to express themselves that way, um, you know, because they would have lost uh, an incredible influence. So, so there's a lot to be learned, I think, by by looking back. And anyway, so uh, you know what I've been doing here as we kind of talk through some of the history is just reinforcing a lot of the shadow patterns moving back back and forth between those resonant colors. Um, you have the blues and the purples and the reds and the yellows and the blues. And now I'm working through and, you know, reshaping different areas that just need, um, you know, a little variance in color and tone, you know, using my trusty paper towel to do so. You know, the effects that come about by wiping paint off oftentimes cannot be created. I've found and I'm reminded over and over again by using a brush, a palette knife, or any other tool. So almost every painting that I do uh, will involve, you know, the process of wiping paint off with a paper towel. And as a matter of fact, the the buildings, the structures on the hillside there and on the ocean wall, nearly uh, all were created by that process. Now I'm just putting in a little bit of a, um, a peachy color. Uh, it's a mixture of yellow and red and a little bit of white and a little bit of uh, Payne's gray. Um, it's kind of a kind of a grayish orange. Um, and it's intended to capture some of the reflection of that you know, reddish area of the sky there in the water. So you know, I'll come back and reapply a couple of times as that gets covered up and wiped away. And all along the way, you know, here from this point forward, as the paint gets thicker, you know, I'll be looking to ensure that there's some variations amongst the strokes used, particularly in the water at this point, and also uh, amongst the clouds in the sky. Really important, we don't want we don't want the blocks of color you know, to be so large that they look like, you know, some sort of, um, you know, monolithic kind of block of blue or yellow. You know, we want to make sure that we create the illusion of ripples on the water as often as we can. And we could do that with broken brushstrokes. In my own painting practice, that's uh, always kind of evolving, you know, right now, I have this Study the Great series. It's a long-term series that I've embarked upon where I'll randomly pick great works done by master painters of the past and, you know, try to recreate them, usually with my own little touches here and there. Um, I have, at this point on my website, you know, about 40 videos uh, that I've posted of, you know, different paintings in progress, you know, with different formats. Some are time-lapse, some are... Uh, you know, live, some are, uh, you know, real-time, normal speed. Some are edited with a mixture, um, you know, kind of varying the speed of the video and so forth, just intending to bring some variety to, you know, the total time that one would need to use in order to view a video like this. And out of the 40 videos I have, uh, at this point, you know, about 15 or 16 of them are, you know, uh, episodes from this Study the Great series. And I typically have covered tonalist painters, um, mostly American painters from uh, the 1850s through the early 1900s. Folks like George and S., Charles Warren Eaton, uh, Bannister, and, and others, Colin Yates. Uh, this is my first attempt to cover one of the, you know, the great impressionists, um, a little intimidating, but I, 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 I like the way it's going so far, you know, and so much of the success of a painting, you know, kind of boils down to the composition and then the tonal qualities of the painting. And if you can get that, you, you can afford to make some mistakes 
in other aspects of the painting and hopefully that carries carries through with this because um, we're off to a decent start at this point. So in any event, I'd ask you to you know, maybe check out my website, thomasmichaelneiman.com. Click on, if you're interested in the, the video content, click on the videos tab. I also have a page where you can register for periodic updates and a blog that I, I tend to update about twice a month. You could also view all of my works, some of my my plain air paintings, some of my animal livestock paintings, my tribute paintings, and so on. If you can, check it out. Again, thomasmichaelneiman.com. Now, I, I just have to give some time and attention to these figures. Um, yeah, this is going to be a little bit of a dance, a delicate dance, between uh, creating uh, some structure and some definition to these figures, but doing so in a way... Um, that is as carefree as possible. We don't want, at this point, we don't want the rendering of these figures to be tight at all. Um, Monet's figures are quite loose. If you look up the original image, uh, you'll see that uh, there's not a lot of detail. There is the illusion of detail um, by way of the variation of brush strokes and uh, color usage and tonal qualities within the figures and just the, the position of their limbs and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, I'll be working on that a little bit here and you know right up to the end where I add the, the little rope that uh, they're pulling on to haul this little vessel into shore. And it'll take some time and care and it'll also take as we'll see coming up, I'll, I'll spend some time painting or refining the negative shapes. That, that's, that's essentially the, the spaces behind them, which uh, mostly will consist of you know, the surf, the water. I'll take a little break from that, and I'm going to use my little scrubber here to build some additional variations in the distant waters, uh, trying to create the illusion of some ways off in the distance. And that's just a uh, a little metal scrubber scrubber brush that I have that I'll just run across, and I'll go back to the boat and the fishermen here. Uh, we got one hanging off of the bow of the boat, and we got two in the water hauling the boat in uh, by way of a rope or a chain. I'm just refining the shape of the boat, hoping to create the illusion of a three-dimensional vessel. And now painting, there's, I guess there's a little bit of a mast and a sail which folds over off of the back of the boat in the original painting. I want to make sure I include that element. And I uh, want to enhance the, the shape of the bodies here almost in full silhouette in a way where uh, you, you get the feeling that or the impression that they're working, they're straining to pull the boat in by way of the angle of their backs and the, you know, the, the, the bend in their knees and maybe the, the arching of their shoulders and the position of their arms. So, uh, you know, thankfully in the wonderful original painting that Claude Monet, you know, completed. It, it provides a, a good template for how to accomplish this. Now, if I, were, if I were doing this for the first time, trying to create these effects from the first time on my own, it'd be much more difficult, uh, much more difficult than copying the original work. And again, my hope is that this will just inform future efforts where I may incorporate a little bit more, uh, you know, figure... Um, figure painting into some of the landscapes that I create. It does, you know, what I like about that is it does, you know, add some interest. Everybody's different and as far as their tastes for art and that sort of thing. Um, you know, some people like looking at elements in nature purely without any <clears throat> evidence of humanity. Some people like to have figures like this. Some people like portraiture, but <clears throat> when you have beautiful natural scenes like this, and then you have um, 
yeah, it was part of the total composition. Some human figures. It does. It does add, you know, quite a quite a bit of special uh, interest. <clears throat> it does make the painting resonate a little bit with you, as you kind of get the feeling that <clears throat> this image might be about something both mundane and quite special. You know, perhaps maybe these are fishermen that spent a long day at sea and they're returning home with their catch, trying to lug it in safely. And that way they can capitalize on the work that they put in out in the ocean and all the risks that they took. And uh, it tells a story. So, you know, I, I appreciate that in the paintings that I view. So, uh, working my way through, you saw I scrubbed with the back of the handle, the brush, um, layering in quite a bit of yellow, that golden mixture of, actually at this point, um, I'm using cad yellow along with yellow ochre and a little bit of titanium white. And up on shore there where the waves might be crashing a little bit more vigorously, a little extra titanium white in that mixture. I hope you'll excuse some of the scratchiness in my throat and the throat clearing <laughs> and the strained nature of my voice from struggling with some, some allergies. We had... Uh, some heavy rains roll through here. There's a lot of moisture in the air and, uh, you know, the fall season will soon be upon us here in northeastern Pennsylvania. So a lot of that is just triggering my allergies. And as I've done all along throughout this painting, um, you know, weaving through the major colors uh, and just add a lot of that golden hue. Now uh, adding some blue all on the way trying to be mindful of you know shaping the wave patterns and uh, you know creating the illusion of ripples on the water and to some degree you know shaping by painting the negative spaces shaping the boat and the and the people in the water now I'm coming across and I'm just going to highlight you know the rim of the um, of that boat there the outer edge of that boat and also create some, you know, some rougher water splashing on the bows. It's being drug on shore. And I'll work at uh, kind of varying that and breaking that up a little bit. It might be a little too strong right now. And I'll use my little makeup blender brush, which I think has seen better days at this point. Unfortunately, some paint dried. So I'll have to get a new one or see if we can clean that one up. And uh, taking some of my Payne's Gray and working my way through to break up some of those brighter spots and reshape the shadow side of those waves that are rolling in on shore. Just keep working our way through. Reinforcing some of the reflections of the lighthouse, the boat, and the people. And going to get a little bit more paint here on my brush. Going to darken some of the shadow side of the boat. As we're working our way through, you know, I'm reminded of an excerpt from Edgar Payne's composition of outdoor painting, his classic. Uh, there's a section under selection and composition where he talks about um, rhythm. And I'll just read from it. Rhythm symbolizes harmony, activity, energy, or movement, yet it calls for a kind of solid footing as a balance, like the flywheel of the steam engine, to hold movement to proper speed. In art, it needs some attachment to the more stabilizing elements to create an artistic visual unity. While rhythm is far-reaching and involves many influences apart from the mechanics of painting, the immediate problem is to arrange the visual factors so the attention will be within the confines of the canvas, which in this instance is the source of the rhythmic feeling. And uh, I, I thought of that. It popped into my head and I looked for it and found it and, and read it for you, uh, mainly because I think in this particular piece, uh, you know, Claude Monet did uh, an unbelievably remarkable job 
of leveraging that concept. There's a balance and a harmony within this painting between the rhythm of the surf washing on, so on shore and uh, the stability of you know the land mass here you know with the lighthouse which in and of itself is a you know is an is an emblem or um you know it's an archetype kind of figure of stability and then these um, large stone or brick structures on shore along with the you know the ocean wall uh you know definitely stable figures meanwhile you have you know kind of like the uh the um you know the, the the sky the movement within the sky and uh, kind of the chaotic work of the fishermen hauling the boat on shore it just creates an odd eerie yet kind of affirming uh rhythm amongst all those different elements and then you know along the lines of Edgar Payne and uh his work you know the the uh, composition of this painting is quite clear. This is, you know, without any shadow of a doubt, this is an this is an S curve composition, um, you know, which which takes the eye from uh, the bottom of the painting up through to the center of the painting, where you get to you know focus in on you know that incredible striking sky, and then. The other lines within the painting tie into that S S curve, um, the the actual lines within and amongst the surf and the waves rolling on shore, kind of take you down to the boat and the fishermen hauling it on shore, and then back up to the beach and that ocean wall and the structures on shore, and then back way off into the distant horizon where the yeah, you know, the distant ocean meets the sky. So uh, just a, an incredible, incredible composition, uh, which uh, leads the eye through the entire painting in a real effective way. So just going through and um, blocking in some of the mid-tone highlight colors in that lighthouse. Um, you know, this is one of those elements where if I was painting larger, I'd probably take greater care uh, to perfect the shape a little bit more. In this case, it's it's such a small canvas and uh, such a small element within the painting. I feel if I struggle to do that, I'm going to make the painting look very stiff. So I'm I'm going to force myself to, you know, just live with some of the imperfections uh, within that lighthouse, and uh, you know, I'll touch I'll touch up some some rough spots here and there, but I'm gonna make sure I don't go out of my way to uh, you know, kind of overwork it. And I'll continue on now through the sky with some of that lavender color. Work my way in, break up some of the blues, and darken some of the original pinkish purple color that's in the sky and use up what I have on my brush here. I try to do that as much as possible, work efficiently, you know, and use the paint that's on my brush uh, if it's going to be helpful in any other secondary areas within the painting. Work my way here through the, through the beach and uh, some of the mid-ground areas as well. Have some of that Payne's gray mixed with some of that lavender color and just keep working my way through. A couple more interesting facts about uh, Claude Monet. He married his wife Camille on June 28, 1870, apparently just before the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War. During the war, he and his family lived in London and the Netherlands to avoid conscription. I guess he, he wasn't into going, going to war. And uh, apparently Monet lived with some friends in what was described as a self, self-imposed self exile. While living in London, Monet met with his old friend Pizarro, and then he also painted with Whistler and other uh, painters as well. 
Um, I believe he saw the works while in London of John Constable and Turner, and it had an influence, particularly Turner's treatment of light had an influence on his work. And actually, during that time, he did quite a few paintings, uh, which which I think are among his best. I, they just they're so so impactful, uh, depicting the fog on the Thames, and he repeatedly painted uh, the the River Thames um, in Hyde Park and Green Park, apparently in the spring of eighteen seventy one. Now, oddly enough, his works apparently were refused um, by the Royal Academy for exhibition, and the police. Uh, suspected him of revolutionary activities. Uh, that same, at that same time, and that same year, he learned of his father's uh, his father's death. So uh, he moved um, his whole family to, uh, I guess I'm going to mispronounce this, Argentil, Argentil, uh, where he was influenced uh, by his time with uh, Dutch painters. Um, I guess he spent uh, some time with, if I'm not mistaken, um, he spent some time with a chemist, uh, Michel Eugene Chevreau. And for three years of the decade, he rented a large uh, villa in St. Denis uh, for a thousand francs per year. Uh, Camille Monet on a garden bench was one of the paintings that, uh, one of the more famous paintings that he painted while while living there. And during that time, apparently Monet and his family, um, you know, they experienced some financial challenges. Um, it was not an easy an easy go for them. They were unable to pay their hotel bill during the summer of eighteen seventy and uh, moved to the outskirts of London as a result of that. Apparently, an inheritance from his father, together with the sales of paintings, did, however, enable them to hire some help around the house, including a gardener in 1872. And then soon after, he had a very successful exhibition of some maritime paintings, and he won the silver medal at Le Havre Monet. Monet's paintings were seized by creditors, from whom they were bought back by a shipping merchant uh, who was a patron of Bodin. So kind of a an interesting interesting little um, you know kind of part of his life there. You know, it's again it's interesting to learn of these painters and you know the the things that they live through in order to be able to create and ultimately reach the level of success that somebody like Claude Monet did later in life. You know, it definitely wasn't an easy road for him. So we're getting to the point in the painting where, you know, I have part of my little internal monologue telling me that I should probably stop. And it's sometimes it's really hard to judge whether or not I should listen. And I think that's the case for, for everybody who embarks on a painting, whether it's an original painting or a recreation like this. But... Um, What's really important at this point is to take time in between brush strokes, in between color mixing, and just look at the painting. Look at your subject. You know, look at the different elements that you want to include in the painting and take some time and care to think about you know, what your next move is. And um, so you'll see fewer brush strokes per second <laughs> as we move forward. But just know that I'm taking a step back and observing the painting and asking myself a couple of key questions, you know, one of which is, you know, what can I do now to elevate this painting? Um, I think it's an important question to ask throughout the whole process of creating a painting, but particularly as you get closer to the end of a painting and the conclusion of a, of a sitting in front of your canvas here. Again, what, what can I do now that will help elevate this painting? And sometimes it's the answer to that question is put down the brush and walk away. <clears throat> and actually, that's one thing I considered doing here at this point in time. I'm just mixing up a little bit more of that golden color. I uh, want to make sure that 
particularly amongst the um, the horizontal planes in between the roll the, the 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 rolling waves that are crashing on shore here that the dominant color is that golden hue, uh, particularly under the part of the sky where you see that little light halo just above and slightly to the left of the lighthouse. And I'll occasionally come back through and sprinkle in some of that blue, but I want the dominant color to be that golden hue. I'm now taking a look, thinking about what the next best step is here. And I'm going to create some color variants in the sky. I want to make sure that, particularly as you get closer to the horizon, you know, we, we have some variation of color. We don't want large, solid streaks. You know, clouds are these... Um, ephemeral kind of floating masses of moisture and you know oftentimes you know light will reflect through them in a, in a very varied way we don't we don't want huge solid masses and I'll weave my way through and bring some of that color down into the water as well as I use it even break up some some of that massive swath of vibrant light coming through. Don't want it to be quite that large. And I'll even work my way up into you know, some of the larger cloud masses in the foreground of the sky plane here. Um, you know, just to vary, vary the color, vary the brush strokes, create some more interest and occasionally I'll pull that color that's left over on the brush again down into the water as well. Using a variety of strokes, um, some sideways strokes, some diagonal strokes, some flopping and padding of the brush, whatever it is that I can do to break up some of the solid masses in a way that hints toward active moving cloud masses. I'm going to work my way through with a cotton swab and do some blending. I'll also use it for some color application and I'm actually going to change my mind here and I'm going to use a toothpick to try and create the illusion of uh, the light reflecting out of the lighthouse from the actual light itself. I definitely don't have the hands of a surgeon <laughs> so you know, using whatever it is I can to steady my hand here. Uh, to get the, through this detailed work. Basically what I'm doing here is I'm jamming my elbow into my stomach of my right hand, bending it at a 90 degree angle and resting my left hand on top of it as a means of steadying it to uh, ensure that I get as close as I can to the target to apply that little, little dab of paint. getting close here to to the finish again taking some time in between and asking myself that key question what can I do to elevate this painting and you know, right now I'm spending some time focusing on that lighthouse and the sky that surrounds it Using quite a few tools in order to do that right now. Back to my little flat brush with a little of that golden hue, but flexing more toward the cad yellow, which is one of the dominant colors in the sky, especially down towards the horizon. Switching in with my cotton swab here to vary the strokes and refine some of the shapes and blend 
uh, around the edges of some of those shapes, including the shape uh, that's intended to depict the lighthouse. So you, if you're still with me, um, you know, I just wanted to say thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed you know, enjoyed this video so far. If you have, or if you found it informative or helpful in any way, you know, please give me a like, please share, please subscribe uh, to my channel. If, you, uh, if you're so inclined to do so, you know, perhaps maybe share with two or three friends that might be interested uh, in this subject matter. And my goal here is not only to create some visibility uh, to my work as a painter, but also to you know, help others who might be interested in learning how to paint. So if you know of anybody who might be interested in doing so, who might be interested in a little bit of art history, um, or maybe is just looking you know, to pass some time in a way that's healthy, um, you know, to avoid some vice or something like that, you know, maybe share, share this with them. If you're inclined to do so, I'd really appreciate it. And again, I want to thank you for your time. So I'm just going to work my way through, vary the patterns within the sky a little bit more. I'm somewhat satisfied with what I just was working on, which is the sky just behind the lighthouse and the lighthouse itself. I don't want to overwork that, like I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to leave it be for the most part and just break up some of the cloud masses here. Yeah, this is one of those interesting skies that you might see, you know, after a, uh, a hazy cloudy day or a storm runs through where you have some, you know, some of those storm clouds maybe remaining or some of the haze, the high haze um, hanging overhead with a break near the horizon. Or maybe it's storm clouds moving in that just haven't covered you know, the clearer sky off in the distance near the horizon, allowing us to see the sunset. So, um, you know, it always, it always creates an interesting di dynamic when you're kind of in between stages in the weather. And that's the feeling that this painting, you know, gives me. I'm taking some time to ensure that um, I'm actually thinking about what the painting might need at this point. And what I'm going to look to do is one of the last final details, put in, you know, the rope that these fishermen are actually pulling on. And uh, unfortunately for me, even though I used my palette knife, I had a little too much paint on there and it went in a little thick, but that's okay. You know, even though the experience is a little harrowing and my heart stopped a little bit, I know I can fix that by painting the negative spaces around the rope and adding some of that golden hue. So that's what I'll do. Before I go ahead and try and put in the, uh, the remaining length of that rope, which will go to the, the second fisherman closest to the shore, I'll go ahead and I'll fix that little bit of rope going from the boat to that. that fisherman with his arms extended toward the boat there. And see if we can thin out that rope a little bit. Bippity boppity boo. Looks like it's all fixed. And we'll just keep moving our way through. No sweat, no fuss, no muss. All right, taking a step back. And I'm going to continue to use some of this paint that's, that's on my brush. Don't want it to go to waste. I would encourage you, by the way, to just Google when you have a free moment of uh, Claude Monet and take a look at his body of work and, um, you know, read more about his life story. Uh, I think he lived to the age of 86 or 87. And... His body of work is so extensive and varied, and most people just know of him, you know, by his very most famous paintings. But very interesting stories, including later in life when he uh, developed cataracts and began to adapt and find ways to create and paint despite the 
loss of his vision. And uh, that actually was the time period within he, which he adapted and painted the Water Lily series, which was largely considered to be decorative art, a form of decorative art anyway, uh, which he freely admitted apparently. But people wanted it, and he painted it, and um, people bought those paintings and used them, and they exist today. And some say even provide a link from that Impressionist period to uh, the modern art period, which I mentioned earlier. All right, so we are putting in some of the final highlights, uh, cutting in some sky holes through some of those purple clouds where you can view some of that brighter uh, canary yellow kind of poking its way through. And I'll shape those a little bit, play around, but we're getting close to the end here. I'm going to refine some shapes. Oops, this actually dropped part of my Part of my toothpick there. I've um, been experiencing a little bit of stiffness and soreness in my in my hand. I think from pitching batting practice uh, and, and weeding in the garden here, but um, it's definitely impacting my ability to pick up smaller items like that toothpick there that I just dropped. So I'm gonna work my way through and. I'm still refining, I want to make sure that I add on the very lip or the edge of those waves that are rolling in uh, some more of that golden hue mixed with a little tint of uh, that cad yellow. Just want to make sure on the, the elevated portion of that wave that rolls in just before it crashes, we're picking up a little, little brighter hint of that light. Also want to make sure I get some of the ripples on the water as well. So once again, I want to thank you for viewing my video here. I hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, learned a little bit, or you think there's somebody uh, within your group of friends or family that might enjoy this, please give me a like, a share, and uh, subscribe to my channel. I'll look to continue this long-term series called Study the Greats. I'll also post videos of the process followed to create some of my original paintings. Also hope to do uh, some videos that include uh, some of the longer hike and paint sessions that I have where I paint plain air after you know, hiking to a destination. I think that should be pretty cool as well. I'm using a liner brush just to add some of the final highlights in the water here. This is a mixture of titanium white. In some cases, some of that golden color. I have a nice puddle of that on my palette. And in other cases, I'll wipe it off and I'll, I'll mix some titanium white with uh, some of the lavender that I have as well and work that in. You know, sometimes the wind will blow through and create these little ripples in between the bigger waves. And just want to make sure there's the illusion, appropriate level of, uh, you know, illusion of detail there. And we're going to wrap up in just a few seconds here. If you can, check out my website, thomasmichaelneiman.com. Give me a like, give me a share, and thanks again for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Have a great day. Stay well.